In this video, we're going to work with a simple circuit. We're going to come up with an equation that relates the inputs and outputs of this circuit. And then based on that equation, we're going to classify the system in terms of the properties that it does or doesn't have. So here is the system we're going to deal with. It's a very simple circuit. There is a current source here on the left called IFT. This current source flows through the capacitor C. The voltage across that capacitor, which I'm calling VC of T, is the system output. So sometimes in the math I'll think of this as Y of T, the output of this system. So input is I of T, output is the voltage across the capacitor. Those are the inputs and outputs. And what we're going to do is we are going to come up with an equation that relates these inputs and outputs to each other. So we'll have a nice mathematical model for the system. And then based on that equation, we're going to determine the properties of the system. So what properties does it have or not have? So the first thing we need to do is be able to write down an equation that ties these two quantities together. If you remember your circuits, you know how the voltage across a capacitor is related to the current flowing through it. And since this current only has one path to flow, we know that I of T, the current source, completely flows through the capacitor. So we can just directly write down the voltage across the capacitor. It's 1 over C times the integral over all time of the current that has flowed through the capacitor. So this is just a basic circuits write down at this point. But this is the equation that we need. It relates the input of our system to the output of our system. And this is the equation that, that we'll analyze now to determine system properties. So the first property we'll talk about, memoryless. Is this a memoryless system. So if you recall the definition of memoryless, a memoryless system has an output at time t that depends only on the input at time t. If we look at our equation, we can see that the output for our system at time t depends on the input at time t, because we integrate up to time t, but also on all past inputs, right? This integral integrates all of the inputs for all time. So since this system model depends on all previous times, this is not a memoryless system. And basically, anytime you work a circuit's problem that has either a capacitor or an inductor, you'll probably always come to the same conclusion that it will not be memoryless because of the nature of the devices in the circuit. So not a memoryless system. All right, before we go on to the next properties, let's just write down that system equation again. And now let's talk about, is this system causal? So causal means the output depends on the current input and past inputs. It's okay to depend on past inputs. We just can't depend on future inputs. So again, if we look at this equation, we see that at time t, the output depends on the input at time t and all past inputs. For causality, that is totally fine. So this is a causal system. The system output only depends on the current and past inputs. All right, what about linear? Is this a linear system? We know if we have a linear system, then superposition must hold. So that's what we check. We check to see if superposition holds. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick an input, I of t, that is a linear combination of I1 of t and I2 of t, where individually, if I put in I1, what comes out is Y1. What If I put in I2, what comes out is Y2. So what I'm doing here is I'm kind of thinking of the output as Y, up here in this equation. So if you want to think of y of t as vc of t, that's fine. I'm thinking it as more of a generic input-output equation here. So we need to go ahead and take this i of t that I've selected, this linear combination of individual inputs, and see if what comes out is a weighted linear combination of y's. If this is a linear system, given this input, what I should get out is alpha 1 y1 of t plus alpha 2 y2 of t. Superposition should hold. So let's go ahead and see if that happens. My output for this input is this equation right here. Remember, the system works by integrating whatever the input is. In this case, the input is this linear combination of things. This integral is really two integrals. I can break that apart into this integral plus this integral. And alpha 1 and alpha 2 are just constants, so I've pulled them out front. And then if I look at this, look what's going on here. This first integral, 1 over c times this integral, that's really y1. If I had written down the equation for what comes out when I put in i1, this is exactly what I would have ended up with. So think about putting i1 of t right there. That's exactly what I would have ended up with. 
Similarly, if I had put in I2 of t all by itself, what would have come out of my system model? This right here. So this by definition is Y2 of t. So what we really have here is alpha 1, Y1 of t, alpha 2, Y2 of t. So superposition has held. A linear combination of inputs yields a linear combination of the corresponding outputs. So this is a linear system. All right, let's go ahead and write down our model again so we have that for this page. And let's talk about time invariance. Is this a time invariant system? If I'm time invariant, delaying the input yields the exact same signal the output, just delayed by the same amount. So I'm going to go ahead and let my input be a time-delayed I of t. So I've time-delayed my signal by t naught. That better that yields the signal y1 of t. By definition, I'm going to call it y1 of t. And what I want to find out is, does y1 of t equal y of t minus t naught? That's what I need to have happen. If i of t yields y of t, i of t minus t naught better yield y of t minus t naught if I'm a time-invariant system. So for now, I'm going to go ahead and call this output y1, and we're going to check to see if this ends up happening. If it does, we're time invariant. If it does not, we are not time invariant. So using my system equation, I can go ahead and compute what y1 of t is. y1 of t, based on my notation here, is the result of putting i of t minus t naught into the system. So I need to integrate over all time the input i of t minus t naught. I'm integrating with respect to tau, so all the taus got replaced by t's. So this is the integral I need to work. It's not readily apparent what's going on here in terms of whether I have t minus t naught or not, but if I do a little bit of a, a rearrangement using a substitution, I can see it pretty clearly. Let's do a substitution. Let's let lambda equal tau minus t naught. So I'm just doing a um, change of uh, integration variables here. If lambda is equal to tau minus t naught, then d lambda is equal to d tau, and I can replace all of the tau quantities in my integral with lambda quantities. So I know when tau is minus infinity that lambda is also minus infinity based on that equation. When tau is equal to t, then lambda should be equal to t minus t naught, so that top limit turns into t minus t naught. And then by definition, lambda is equal to tau minus t naught, so this is just i of lambda. And then d tau and d lambda are equal to the same, so I just end up with a d lambda there. So I've done a change of variable there, and I end up with this new integral, and look at what this looks like. This looks like my original equation with all the t's replaced by t minus t naught. So look at this equation right here. There's only one t. It's sitting right here. And that t in this equation has been replaced by t minus t naught. So this looks just like y of t minus t naught. So guess what? y1 does equal y of t minus t naught. So this is a time invariant system. All right, one more property. BIBO stable. Bounded input, bounded output stable. Is it a BIBO stable system? I'm going to show that it is not. So I'm going to choose an input current that's just a unit step. So let's let i of t be u of t. This is clearly a bounded input because the unit step is bounded by the number 2, for instance. 2 is bigger than this for all time. Let's compute what the output is for this input. The output in this case would be the integral from minus infinity to t of the unit step. Well, we know what this is. This is also equal from 0 to t of the unit step because the unit step is 0 for all negative time. What is this integral right here? We know that the integral of the unit step is the unit ramp. So I just have the unit ramp function sitting there. So this is really equal to 1 over c times r of t. And we know what that looks like. That's a quantity that ramps up as a function of time because that's what the ramp function does. So look what happens. As t gets large, this signal grows without bound. This just goes up forever and ever and ever. So by choosing an input that was bounded, I have found an output that is not bounded. So that means that this is not a BIBO-stable system. So when showing that something is not BIBO-stable, all you have to do is find one example that makes things break. So I've, I chose a single, very specific bounded input, and I computed the output and showed that it was unbounded. That's enough to show that something is not BIBO-stable. If we had a different example and we were trying to show that it was BIBO-stable, that's a little bit more difficult because I need to show that it is BIBO-stable for all bounded inputs. 
When you do those problems, you have to work them a little bit more generically. Showing something is not BIBO-stable is pretty easy because you just have to find an instance where a bounded input yields an unbounded output. And that concludes our problem. We had a simple circuit. We found an equation that related the input and output to each other. And then using that equation, we determined all the properties that the system had or didn't have.